So tēnā koutou katoa. Tonight we have Sandy and Emily with us doing a dual presentation. Um, this will be on improving medicine access, equity and primary care. I'm now going to hand you over to Sandy, who's going to open our evening with a karakia. Kia Cathy, and thank you for that. So the karakia I've got is about unity, and I'm going to have a go at reading it in te reo. Um, and here we go. Tuya e runga, tuya i raro, tuya i waho, tuya i roto, tuya te here tangata, ka rongo te po, ka rongo te ao, haumie, huie, taikie. And this is about unite above, unite below, unite without, unite all people. Conscious of the night, conscious of the day, now we come together as one. Thank you. So this evening, as I say, so we've got our little introduction for you. So Pharma is dedicated to achieving medicine access, equity in Aotearoa, so everyone has fair opportunity to reach their full health potential. Sandy will talk us through the research and approaches developed by Pharmac to reach this goal. Then Emily will talk to us about how this can be achieved using an example of her work and the Tefana. Oh, you've got me on that one. Sorry, Emily, you can correct me on that. Tefana Apuni Community Health Centre, a remote rural practice in the Eastern Bay of Plenty. Sandy comes from the Pharmac with the management, the manager of access equity for Pharmac. And we've got Emily with us, a general practitioner, researcher and senior, senior lecturer in the Department of General Practice and Primary Health here at University of Auckland. And at this point, I'll hold you over to Sandy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cathy. So um, as Cathy sort of outlined, there's the two of us doing a joint presentation and that gives you a bit of a sense of the outline and what we're going to talk about today. Um, now, I wanted to start with Pharmac's reason for being, and this slide there just gives you a bit of a sense of what is our statutory function, and that's to secure for eligible people, as you know, need, um, in need of pharmaceuticals, the best health outcomes that we can achieve from what we're able to do. The reason I always start with our statutory function also is to give us a sense of um, the why of this work. Um, actually, I was meant to also say that there are a few polls that we're gonna do throughout um, tonight. So what we've decided to do is that, that these polls will come up as we give cues to the host and you can do these polls and we'll probably see the results at the end of it. So at this stage, the first poll that might come up, which is actually going to be about um, your type of practice, where is it that you guys are working? Um, and so that'll come up at some stage. We really wanted to get to the point of well, why is excess equity actually important to us if we are doing the best health? Because our job is to get the best health outcomes from the medicines that we've already funded. Um, oh, there is the poll. <laughs> okay. And I'll carry on while um, uh, you guys are having a, a good go at voting. I wanted to talk to you today also about um, our identity. This is Pharmac's identity in Te Reo Māori, which is Te Pātaka Whairanga, which is really our storehouse of well-being, and it sums up the part that we play um, in managing and safeguarding something that is valuable to all New Zealanders, which is really the pursuit of well-being. So Pharmax um, work in this area really started going, okay, well, we are making a whole lot of medicines actually um, available, but are people actually um, accessing it and therefore are they receiving the best health outcomes from it? This slide here kind of gives you um, a sense of the research that I think backs up the why for us. At two time periods, we've done research to show that actually when we look at the medicines that um, are being taken up or look at the variations in access, we find that the key takeouts are Māori are getting 1 million fewer prescriptions. It does, that means missed opportunities to improve health. And over the two time periods, what we are seeing is that inequities continue. We have been seeing some improvement in persistence, i.e. people are, are, are continuing to take up their medicine, um, continuing to take medicine once they've picked it up. I did want to point out here that that 1 million fewer prescriptions is actually a number which is theoretical in the sense that we've not just compared rates of dispensing for Māori or non-Māori. What we have done is we've done 
exactly that rates of dispensing that has been age standardized, but also added a needs adjuster so that we have a good sense of the health need. And so what that really represents is the number of prescriptions that were actually never written for Māori. Um, we delved into it a little bit um, further. And this graph here kind of gives you a sense of, well, where was the shortfall the biggest? And actually the largest shortfall was seen um, in cardiovascular medicines, as you can see that graph showing you. And the shaded area shows you the shortfall in access for the first time getting a prescription. And the darker um, the solid lines kind of give you a sense of um, a, the, the shortfall in the persistence of medicines. Now you can see cardiovascular is, is quite a large shortfall and we know what the health outcomes also look like for, for Māori in, in cardiovascular disease. So I guess we're making uh, um, an association by proxy here that inequities in access to medicines is actually also contributing to the inequities in access in health outcomes. This graph also shows you a little bit of the areas where medicines are actually uh, being prescribed probably inappropriately in the sense that we're Māori are getting far too many non-steroidals, for example, and we know that there is good evidence to support that in the management of gout. Um, so that's the kind of analysis that we've been able to do. We were curious to see whether or not actually in within the cardiovascular disease um, therapeutic group, was this just to do with one medicine um, or was it across the board? And essentially the take out message from this slide is actually it's across the board. What this slide sort of shows you is that overall Māori are receiving these medicines at a rate of 57% of what should be, despite these medicines being funded for many years and they generally have been listed on the schedule without any restrictions. And I guess this is where um, we started going, okay, so the medicines are being funded, they are fully listed but the data is showing this huge inequity in access to these medications. Now let's look at the system of, of actually getting access to a, um, a funded medicine. So this slide is a very simple, simplistic diagram um, that currently shows you the pathway actually a patient has to follow in order to get access to a funded medicine. And what you can see in this diagram is actually along every step, there is a barrier that can come in the way. And what we do know that populations that experience inequities are disproportionately um, ex you know, experiencing these barriers some far more than the other. So cumulatively, if you can imagine someone going through each of these steps and having a barrier at one point, this can affect them quite disproportionately. Now at this stage, I'm going to ask for poll number two to come across. And this is really just getting a sense of um, whether or not before this webinar, you actually knew about um, our mahi on medicine access equity. So it's a very simple one. It's a yes or a no poll that'll come on your screens. Now, if you did know about our mahi, you would be familiar with this publication. And this is actually our capstone key publication and the remainder of my presentation or the what I'm going to discuss is actually all available in this publication and you can access this from our website. I think one of the key points that I'd like to make is actually we are absolutely very aware that this inequity in medicines access that we are seeing is actually a subset of the inequity um, in access to healthcare generally, which then of course sits in this concentric circle of inequities and in social determinants of health and the much larger structural inequities that um, I experienced. So that really is that conceptual relationship. In our document, we talk about um, some definitions and this was really important for the work that we wanted to begin is what do we mean when we say medicines excess equity and what would it look like actually if we did achieve medicines excess equity? Um, well, if we did have it, then everybody would have a fair opportunity to access funded medicines to attain their full health potential and no one should be disadvantaged from achieving this potential. This particular document also talks about our scope, you know, what is our focus? Um, we are definitely interested, as our research was all to do with medicines that have already been funded, we are looking at the medicines, those medicines um, in primary care, 
but we've chosen specifically conditions that are significantly amenable to medicines. And you can see on the slide that those conditions are cardiovascular disease, gout, um, diabetes, um, asthma, and to some extent COPD, although the first four are probably the key ones for us. Now, a lot of people, um, as we've engaged on this work with the sector, have said those populations that you've got there, there are other populations as well that should be priority populations. And um, we, while we agree with that, I think the scope at the beginning, what informed us with this populations was actually these are the shared characteristics of populations who experience inequities in New Zealand generally. Now, Māori for us is definitely our priority. They are our treaty partner, and that makes them priority for that reason, but also the evidence that sits behind the, the health outcomes for them. So that they definitely are our priority population for, for this piece of work. There's quite a bit of um, a nice picture in this publication called the Medicines Access Equity Driver Diagram. And it just depends on the device you're on. Some of you might find this quite busy. It's okay. I think there's a few things that, uh, three points probably I'd like you to get across from here is when Pharmac was looking at the definition and the problem definition of medicine access equity, it wanted to look across the system. What is it that from when a medicine becomes available um, impacts on, on the quality and the how outcomes that someone can get from these medicines. So this driver diagram, that's why you've got five primary drivers. So the first thing is actually the medicine has to be available in the country as a publicly funded medicine. And a lot of that is actually within Pharmax control and depending on the budget that we get to spend as well. The second part of the driver diagram, which is uh, speaking to the drivers of accessibility, affordability, and acceptability is really got to do with factors that impact um, a population's extent, um, a population's um, ability to gain um, access to those medicines. So um, I'm going to focus a little bit on the accessibility driver in, in a while because that relates really closely to what Emily is going to speak about later on. And the very final driver, which is medicine appropriateness, that's really just speaking to the quality and the relevancy of prescribing that is occurring in the reviewing so that when some a medicine has been prescribed, there is a process by which the person is actually experiencing the best health outcomes from that medicine. So bear with me as I flick through a few slides, but I am going to just focus on one particular driver just to give it um, some context for tonight. Um, so medicine accessibility really is speaking to the fact that um, people don't, it's, in, it's about ensuring people don't face challenges, um, getting to see a prescriber or to get to your pharmacy to get your medicine or to actually get your diagnostics and monitoring done in order to get a renewal of, of your prescription. And um, in, in the remote setting and rural settings, I think this is a particular challenge that actually starts to really impact on how people are able to actually access medicines or not. And the other drivers, um, are affordability. You'll notice some of these um, colored dots, actually. That was really useful for Pharmac to have a bit of a sense of where it has got control, where it has got a bit of a role, and where it has influence. And again, in our publication, there is um, a, a lovely narrative behind each one of these that actually explains what they mean and also the evidence that backs up that these barriers uh, or these drivers definitely have a part to play in inequities in access to medicines that we are seeing um, in New Zealand. Now, if you know anything about Pharmac, you will also know that we are incredibly evidence-based and incredibly data-driven, so we do nothing without this. And I'm really proud to say that alongside this piece of work, what we have developed is a medicines access equity and monitoring outcomes framework, which actually is using a uh, data analytics approach to be able to kind of figure out, well, where are we at? Where do we need to get to? And how do we track that we are getting there? Um, and I think my colleague Jason Arnold is online listening as well. So this is quite a bit of the work that he is doing. Um, I, I think what I would like to impart through these next couple of slides is actually know that there is a, 
uh, medicines access monitoring and outcomes framework. We are in the process of implementing and operationalizing this framework. You will start to see from us once we've had methodology um, validated, some population level measures for those conditions that I've mentioned, and also for the populations, especially Māori and Pacific. Um, you will start to see data in variations in access, medicine adherence, and medicine persistence. You'll also um, start to see some data that gives you a bit of a sense of, well, what is the difference for accessibility for Māori, for non-Māori, for affordability and acceptability? This is um, a bit of a challenge for us to find measures for these, but our first go is actually using the primary care patient experience um, survey data to give us a bit of a sense of these differences in these drivers as well. And also getting a sense of, um, you know, how much are they impacting? So um, I've, I know I've raced through them, but that's because we want to give an opportunity to have a bit more of a discussion towards that, towards later. So you can come back and ask questions or. Um, as we go through on this. That um, brings me a little to the end of my part of the um, presentation. And what you see on that slide is, is really, it sort of links back to our karakia as well, that actually the, the drivers are quite complex. It is not just about making the medicines available. That is simply one part of it. Um, not all of these drivers are actually under direct control of Pharmac. Um, and it will require a whole of sector approach and commitment to, to get this um, corrected. And it is a really bold goal and um, we have taken um, leadership of it. I want to also say that um, we are, as an organization, also taking a deep look at ourselves and examining our own decisions and processes so that we are making um, pro equity decisions in, in that sense. So that formally brings a conclusion to my part of the presentation. What I would like to do is just to, uh, before I introduce Emily is actually, you might have noticed um, that the, the, the slide, my slide has got a, a new, it had a new, um, I guess a company or a name that you might not have seen before, a program name. And that's actually He Akohiringa. So He Akohiringa is, is our new, um, a responsible use provider that Pharmac uh, is working with and um, tonight really is a, a way of, of introducing the sector to He Ako Hiranga, Hiranga and its educational um, program that will be entirely focused on the medicine access equity mahi. They will be providing a range of services and tools to primary care clinicians and these will include educational resources with a focus on access equity. Um, they will also deliver the EPIC dashboard. And the EPIC dashboard is actually a prescriber data tool that He Ako Hiringa will launch in January, 2021. Um, and every clinician who has signed up to He Ako Hiringa will have access to their own EPIC dashboard. I'm told that EPIC is short for something. So it actually stands for Evaluating, Prescribing and Informing Care. And it's um, currently under testing um, by He Ako Hiringa. So Alicia Smith will actually be giving a mobile health webinar on this um, dashboard on the 8th of December, explaining the dashboard if you would like to um, learn more. And as I said before, He Ako Hiringa will entirely um, turn its focus on our medicine access equity. So they will be focusing on the conditions that I have already mentioned, which are priority conditions, and also the populations that I have also mentioned. So the important homework for you guys um, before, after tonight, is actually to go find He Ako Hiranga and sign up with them. Because once you've signed up, you can then have access to what they are doing um, and also further information about them as well. Right, so that's um, He Ako Hiranga. And I would now like to um, introduce to you Dr. Emily uh, Gill. And um, I want to just give some context as to why, why have we got Emily co-presenting with us. Now, Pharmac has not only just been developing a publication and a framework and a medicines access equity monitoring outcomes framework, it also has had the intent of learning from the ground what is happening on the ground um, with medicines access equity. And in 2019, it partnered with the Health Quality and Safety Commission's um, 
uh, Whakakotahi Primary Quality Improvement Program. And that led to three uh, on the ground projects, actually quality improvement projects that were looking to improve medicine access equity. And Emily has been the co-lead of the one at Te uh, Whanui, uh, uh, Apanui Community Health Center in Te Kaha, Bay of Plenty. And so she is going to give you a sense of what it was like to work in this space um, in a very beautiful part of New Zealand. So without further ado, I am going to stop screen sharing and um, hand it over to Emily. Namihi Nui, uh, Sandy, thank you very much. Is it possible to show the results of the poll um, just before I screen share? Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Well, tēnā kōta katoa, everybody. Welcome to my section of the webinar. For a little bit more context about uh, who I am, my accent is because of my American ancestry. And though I was born here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I actually grew up uh, in the United States in my formative years. And so I identify as uh, Tangata Titiriti, or a person of Titiriti or Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi. So as I'm going to share my presentation, since I also have a role with the university and deliver webinars, I'm the one who's presenting this evening, but it's very much on behalf of the Te Whanuapanui Community Health Centre. The person who I most want to tautoko and shout out to is Kiritanga Sawage, who was the improvement facilitator for this quality improvement project that we did that Sandy referred to that was part of the uh, Whakakotahi program that HQSC and Pharmac helped support us with. And um, Kiritang Savage and most of the staff at the Te Whanuapuni Community Health Centre, Whakapapa back to this beautiful part of the country. And I hope all of you are at some point able to come up and visit the Rohe in the area. So just a huge shout out to all the hard work of Kiri. So the, we're, this, this presentation is going to be very much a from a GP and a practice perspective of what some of the things that Sandy was referring to, what it felt like on the ground. So just as far as geographic location, the practice that, so I'm a part-time GP at this practice. We have just over 1500 enrolled patients at the moment. And the geographic area we serve is 150 kilometers along the east coast of the North Island in the Bay of Plenty. And that, um, includes 1.5 FTE GP, 2.6 FTE nurses, 2.0 FTE admin staff, and just over half time an allied healthcare system. We provide a full uh, set of GP and practice nurse services. We're the only primary care provider along that uh, stretch of, of um, in the region. And we offer 24 hour primary uh, prime services, which I, I assume a lot of you are probably familiar with. The nearest pharmacy to where our main clinic is, which is in Takaha, is about an hour's drive away. We do have satellite clinics though that are further down the close. So the clinic that's the furthest away is Waiho Bay. And so that would be about an hour and 45 minutes drive um, to the nearest pharmacy. As you are all uh, fellow rural residents, one of the ways to describe your remoteness or, and rurality is to, in terms of driving distance to other services. So the nearest supermarket, which is one supermarket, New World, is in Oporki, which is an hour's drive away, and that's where the, the pharmacy is, where there's two pharmacies in Oporki. It's a two-hour drive to Fakatai, which is the nearest inpatient hospital. Taranga, which is further another hour down the road is the closest place for say uh, angioplasty suite and an MRI machine and Hamilton is our closest referral tertiary center. The practice we're one of three uh, special area primary care services we operate outside the primary the PHO system 
that primary health care organization system and um, it's free for patients to come to our service, to our practice. It's a predominantly Maori community with 13 Hapu and Marae. We have three schools in our Rohe in the boundaries and we're cornerstone accredited. So when we started on this project of doing a quality improvement project, we it involved the whole team. And so though um, I'm presenting, it's very much, this was a team effort. So, and as I mentioned at the beginning, Kitty really did most the work, but she was able to do that work because of the support of the rest of this lovely team. So when we were asked if we would like to do a quality improvement project and what would that be, we wanted to do something that was meaningful to us. And one of the things that really has frustrated us over many years is the phone calls we get with people asking, where's the medicines? So in terms of access in the, in the um, driver diagrams that Sandy was talking about, this story is very much about physically receiving medicines. That's the piece of the access story that this, uh, our project was about. And for years we would get, we would all spend time fielding these calls about where is my medicine? And we would have, it would intermittently come up at practice meetings and we'd throw around some ideas and try this or that but it just was this kind of ongoing problem that we never really could get our heads around what to do about it so we started thinking about that and even trying to articulate what that problem required us to um, have the support of one of the uh, quality improvement facilitators to even help us work out what the actual problem was that that practically meant a three or four hour evening one night after after the clinical was shut what we were able to develop th through that process was um, an aim. So that's one of the first steps of a quality improvement project is you have to figure out what you're trying to improve. So we decided that we would aim for over 90% of the patients who go to our outreach clinic at Waiho Bay, which is the furthest away from a pharmacy. And we would think about for the medications that they are prescribed, when it's when they have a um, when the GP when a GP decides to prescribe something, and we have only a weekly GP clinic at Waiho Bay. So on the day that the GP clinic happens, when a prescription is generated, we wanted that not over ninety percent of the patients would get those medicines in their hands within forty eight hours, because we thought, well, if the pharmacy was down the road five minutes away. That would, that would be a reasonable expectation for urban counterparts who have a pharmacy within five minutes of the practice. Now, I'm going to stop, well, I'm, I'm going to keep going, but while we keep going, there's going to be another, the final poll that's going to pop up on your screen. And this is because I'm not really sure if this story I'm telling is relevant anywhere else in the country. So it may just be us, but I'd be keen to know how many of you who are listening tonight how many of you have a pharmacy within five minutes either drive or walk from the practice where you operate? And because there was quite a few pharmacists, maybe I'll switch the question around. How many of the pharmacies have a GP serve a GP practice that's not five minutes drive or walk away? So, um, so it's just, um, it's, I'm, we're not sure how many other practices in the country have this problem. The other part of the aim question to just clarify is what MPSO is, which I think many of you may be familiar with. So MPSO is the medical practitioner supply order. So when there isn't a pharmacy, we stock medications on site at the clinic. And that's a specific list of medications that is meant for acute care. So. Those, pro those medications we can give to people, you know, when they're in the clinic. So that, that access delivery wasn't a problem. Our problem was with the medications that were non-MPSO, which is essentially the chronic care medications, the repeat prescriptions. And it's the medications that Sandy was talking about that are there to treat the amenable conditions that disproportionately um, impact uh, Māori specifically. So that was the focus of our aim, was to try to see if we could get those types of medications to people within 48 hours. As we were trying to think about what to do about this 
problem, the first thing we realized through a quality improvement project was you have to figure out what the problem is. And so we used various quality improvement tools that none of us had heard of before, such as affinity charts, driver diagrams, fish bones, process mapping. And we needed quality improvement people to come and tell us what those all meant. And what it looked like on the ground was meetings, lots of sticky notes, and putting things up on the wall like you see in this picture. <clears throat> Now, some of us were a bit skeptical about whether all this time would be a useful activity. In the end, it was very helpful to clarify our thoughts because what, we, what it turned out was that when we would spend, it sometimes was like three or four hours with some of these um, quality improvement tools, we realized that we all had a very different perspective of what was going on from the time a prescription was printed out on the printer to when a patient actually got the medications in their hands. There was a lot of people involved from that point A to point B. And through that process mapping, we suddenly uncovered all the ways in which it was very logical now to understand why the medications weren't getting to patients. I'm not going to go through all of the different um, uh, processes because they were it was actually very complex. I'm going to show you a driver diagram in a moment that sort of shows you that complexity. So I'm, just to say that it was complex and if in the question and answer time I'm happy to talk more about that if people are interested. Now the other part of quality improvement is you have to gather data. Now with this specific problem that we were struggling with there was no BPAC audit tool that we could just simply run an audit on. So we had to actually create our own ways of gathering data. So we needed our own measure, our own way to collect data. Well, that in itself was difficult. Like, what does that look like? How do we do that? So we start, so um, Kiritana and the other staff started with these pieces of paper where we thought, well, what we'll first do is just document when we get a communication about somebody's missing a medication, what has actually happened in that particular scenario. So we did that. And so our first sort of measurement analysis looked like this. So not unexpectedly, most of the communications that were coming into the clinic saying missing a medication was from patients, 87%. But there was actually 8% that it was actually the pharmacist who was ringing up saying, we don't have a script or um, the patient's ringing because they haven't got medications. And sometimes it would be a FANO member. The other part that we were trying to figure out is where were people expecting to get their medications? Most patients expected their medications to come to depots. So depots are places along the coast like dairies where the pharmacy has a relationship with that um, dairy where people can go to pick up the medication. So that is where most people would get the medications, but there were other places too. People, some people arranged for the pharmacy to deliver to their mailbox. Some people actually traveled in town to pick them up. So I, meant, I mentioned before that I would just show you the complexity. So I don't expect anybody to read anything on the slide. The point is that when we broke down what the problem was, there were so many places where, a medicine, it, where the script, the piece of paper and the medicine might go missing. This, uh, Sandy referred to a driver diagram. This was very helpful for us to try to then think about what we do next and how to change it and improve it. This is kind of the, the main slide in terms of our results. What we ended up realizing is that the best measurement tool was a very manual process. So we focused on the YHOVE patients who where there was one day a week when most of the scripts were generated. That was at the GP clinic on a Tuesday. And so what we did was write down the list at the end of the clinic of everybody who'd had a script. Then one of the staff, mostly Kitty, would ring up a patient 72 hours later, those patients on that list later in the week and say, have you got your medicines? And then that was a simple yes or no answer. And that was a measurement tool that we could then plot over time. So every week for all of these dates here on the graph, somebody was able to ring up those patients individually and get a number of, of a percentage of the scripts generated, how many people had got them. And you can see we were some weeks, it was 100%, everybody got the medicine, but then there were other weeks that there was only 40% of people who got the medicines. So then we looked at this graph and the up and down and tried to think, well, what is it that's different? And we realized that it was different staff members. So clearly there were staff that were doing something different one week from another week. That led us to basically the change that has made a sustained difference. And it is this piece of paper. 
So what we realized is we had to streamline where all the pieces of paper of the prescriptions went to. So now they all go to the nominated administrative person who is kind of the kaitiaki and guardian of the scripts for the day. And that person writes down every single script that has been generated, gets the scripts to the pharmacy by fax, and then the pharmacy is sent this list. And the pharmacy can then tick to make sure they actually did receive the script that was generated that day. And this tool, this piece of paper has become invaluable because when a patient might ring up and say, I'm missing a, med a, a medicine, we can pull out the paper and say, well, it was sent, the pharmacy did receive it. And then, okay, maybe there was a problem with the courier. It helps streamline and target where there might be a breakdown in this process. So that was all of that, which I have walked you through was a lot of work over about 18 months. Part of a good project like that is finding out what everybody thinks about it. And again, I'm not expecting everybody to read the comments here, but just to highlight that there was a lot of people behind what I've just presented and we all had our different perspectives, but overall it was a very positive experience. <clears throat> Some of the barriers though, were when you're doing a quality improvement project, there's a lot of information. So one of the mainstays of quality improvement activities is you use a, a, a technical tool in New Zealand, there's, it's a software program called LiveQI. It's based on the, on the web. It's a, it's a platform. Well, the expectation was that we would use that platform to work through this problem. Well, even in that self, like learning a new piece of software could be a big challenge because it was kind of a complicated um, system to log into and to figure out how to use the different features. Another barrier, of course, was that this was all outside of clinic time. And so we were all, I mean, we have a full clinic. And so um, it was very difficult to find the time to have the meetings and to talk through what the problem was to even make those phone calls at 72 hours later that's a piece of time that's you have to find between seeing patients so um and that included finding even time to catch up with the lovely people who were supporting us like sandy and the team the whakakotahi team but there was lots of wonderful successes. And probably the main thing we appreciate is that there is this thing called quality improvement that can help you work through a problem and figure out a solution that actually does make a difference. And that is about data collection. That's really important. So we have a lot more respect for that now as a team. The other success was just reinforcing that we the importance of a good team and we it's just we have been told multiple times how these projects are most successful with a team that's really cohesive and this project really helped us realize what a great team we have and the advance the example of that is because it took so much time the GPs and practice nurses who were left at the clinic, we, we covered each other when um, a staff member had to take time away from the practice to do the quality improvement project. So, and it was wonderful to meet a wider state, uh, a wider group of people outside of our clinic. Um, so there were, there's been lots of benefits to us. And so basically the take homes for us as the team were, and were, um, that measurement is important, um, that to do a successful improvement in a project really takes everybody in the team. And um, yeah, we really should, we would like to keep going. So it's just a matter of how we <laughs> fit it into clinical life. And this is a lovely summary diagram, which is publicly available on the Health and Quality Safety Commission website for the Whakakotahi program. And I'm sure we can email it out to people and it hopefully just brings summarizes. I won't leave it up for too much longer, but it summarizes what I've said. So just to know that there is a summary of this if, if people are interested. All right, so thank you for listening. And maybe could we have the poll presented for, um, whether that story that I've just shared is useful for other people or not. Okay, so it is sort of a unique experience, but hopefully there's been something in that that has been of interest to everybody. Kia ora. 
Wow, ladies, you are oozing with enthusiasm this evening. You're going to carry us for at least another five years with all your planning. It's fantastic. <laughs> We've got a few questions coming in. So is it all right just to pose those to you both now? Some of it's comments and some of it's actually looking for responses. I better just plug, plug for Jason as well. He says, thank you for the plug to you as well, Sandy. <laughs> and so um, one of the earlier questions we had was about affordability. Um, is Pharmac working towards getting zero charge um, script fees from a national level? <laughs> That's a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> um, I think that the comment I would make is actually the, the co-payment policy as a policy, as a national policy, and it is owned um, by the Ministry of Health. We are definitely, as a Crown Air entity and agency, um, highlighting the co-payment uh, issue that is um, you know, coming to fruition or has it having an impact. And I think in, in saying that, um, that is not the silver bullet though, just on its own. It, it is actually about all the drivers. So um, that's that's been our, our work in this space. And there's certainly really good evidence, especially in Australia that has shown that where there has been a policy that's been introduced, that's taken the co-payment away for the Aboriginal and the Torres Strait people, they have actually done almost a, a longitudinal follow-up study and found some really good increase in medication adherence, but also the clinical indicators from some cardiovascular medicines. So I think it's a researcher by the name of Amal Trivedi who has done that. So we are certainly um, putting this evidence and, and having these discussions with, with the policy owners um, of, of the co-payment in New Zealand. Thank you. And I think you might have people in the Cook Islands and the Philippines looking into similar things because we've got people from both those places ah. listening in tonight as well. <laughs> oh, thank you. Nice say. And so just in terms of for you, Emily, someone did just comment as well to say that South Westland and the South Island has similar distances from clinics to their pharmacies, if not more than what you were saying. So yeah, just another example for you. Um, there was a comment asking about whether there's going to be a Facebook page to do with the Teako Hiranga? Yes, yeah, so I think um, a staff member from Teako Hiranga has come back and said that they will be live, that will be alive tomorrow. So I right. think tomorrow there's a whole lot of things that will be live from, from what I can gather. So, yes. Thank you. And so then another one here we've got, why, um, why are pharmacists not being enabled to close these gaps? Um, they've just sent an email to the Pharma Pharma Pharmaceutical Society of New Zealand on that. I don't know, Emily. I mean, the, the project team, it's a team effort, isn't it, to, to yeah. close this gap? So I don't know if you've got any uh, comments to um, help answer that question. I certainly found from your project that it was a team effort that you needed pharmacists as well as the general practice as well as your team. Yes, for sure. So in our and I didn't emphasize the role of the pharmacy enough uh, in the presentation. So that sheet that um, was sent to the pharmacy each day that was actually developed with the pharmacist and it was really fantastic actually right at the beginning when we were trying to unpack this problem a couple of the pharmacists from town actually made the big trip down the coast to be with us for at least one if not two of those long meetings I was telling you about when we were doing process mapping and the fish diagrams to try and unpack what was going on so they the pharmacists were absolutely part of the conversation to try to figure out what the problem was and then in terms of finding the solution they were part of okay yes I think that would be helpful to have this piece of paper that sent to them once a day kind of to audit what should be coming through and then to have it as a reference if things have gone missing so I think in our particular project the pharmacists were having a role in um, addressing that gap so, but I'm not sure if the particular question has been is more about um, I don't know if that's leading to say pharmacists prescribing or um, <clears throat> not just the getting the medicines to the patient. 
although in our project that was a big issue, um, this is a much bigger question possibly. Um, and certainly I, I personally, like for instance, warfarin um, dose adjustment has been fantastic, I, I have found. So that, but that only worked for where I work in town where the pharmacy is fine, where patients can go to a pharmacy. So that doesn't apply to where there's not a pharmacy. So yeah, I, there must be some more roles for pharmacy mm. to help in this conversation. And I think at the big systems level, that was the idea of putting that driver diagram that actually health professional groups, health will we'll take this away and kind of have a bit of a karera amongst themselves of what is their role, um, which particular driver are they able to actually influence in order to close right. that, that gap. So I think yes. um, there's definitely that collective responsibility that each professional body does also have. So thank you for sending the email to Pharmaceutical Society of New Zealand. I'm just going to declare my conflict at the moment. I am actually an elected board member of the of PSNZ, so that'll come to, to us for discussions. <laughs> um, but, you know, just uh, that was, I guess, um, and I'm not being flippant about the question, that is the idea is that if we can look at it as a systems view, actually, these are all the different things that make a difference to medicine access equity, all those five drivers. Now, if everybody went away and looked at their part that they can play, I think that cumulatively, the idea is we would definitely get to a point of achieving equity. Thank you. That was well answered, ladies. <laughs> um, I, I, there's a few comments floating around between the chat and the questions around the e-prescribing and about the, the position that it plays in this situation going forward and about how some can take 30 minutes to get from five minutes down the road to the pharmacy. And someone's comments think it can be up to 48 hours for e-prescriptions e to reach a pharmacist. And then there's, there's some comments around the broadband and about recognising where that fits in the rural side of things too. But I thought that's probably quite relevant to the work in terms of what Emily's done in getting prescriptions to people and feeding them out. Well, so. what's kind of interesting, I'll just jump in and just give you, it was kind of interesting. When we started this project, I assumed e-prescribing was going to be the solution. Actually, it isn't. Well, for our particular context, it makes no difference. So during COVID, of course, we had the advantage if we already had a whole system worked out that we'd actually spent all of last year refining of getting patients medications without the patients actually having to physically go to the pharmacy. So the e-prescribing would eliminate a small part of that complex process that we unpacked. Um, in the in the end and it wasn't a broadband issue so in the end our issue was a firewall problem between our system talking to the the NZ EPS, the, the New Zealand e-prescribing program, and then the pharmacy can't download our data anyway it was it was all technical but in the end I'm not I think it'll be nice when we have e-prescribing, but I, I actually realized we're gonna be able to implement e-prescribing very seamlessly because it will just replace faxing. And yes, to the point that faxing is gonna be obsolete, absolutely. But I feel that we're now really ready to embrace e-prescribing. Will it make a huge difference? It might make things a little bit easier, but actually um, it was the process that was the most important thing and having refining our processes on our end that was the most important thing. Thank you very much. Um, another one we've got here, the, the first part of this question, I believe you actually did answer in the beginning of your talk when you said it was about the 1 million less prescriptions being written, but I think you did also, you said that that wasn't a specific number, that was one that the suspicious number that had been done. The second part of this question is quite interesting though. How well do we understand if patients decline a prescription or if it wasn't offered? Uh, not very well. So, I, and that really is speaking to the data that is available. So, we at the moment have national data set collection only about dispensed medicines. We do not have a national data set collection that tells you about prescribed medicines and if they were prescribed, did the patients decline? That sits in the PMS systems of the prescribers and it actually doesn't feed anywhere. So, the idea behind NZEPS, of course, is that that data eventually will be available so that there is a better match of the, the, the quantum of the gap between what's prescribed versus what's dispensed. 
So right at this very minute in New Zealand, we, we certainly don't have um, eyes on that. You know, what is, the, what is that quantum? What does that gap look like between prescribed and dispensed data? Thank you. And then we've got MPSO supply has created issues for us with secondary care as they are not logged on nation's database and set secondary care up for failure. Some of it around cost barriers and that created patient history issues and patients going to practice for free medications. I, I can, I'm going to speak to the MPSO because there's also another question directed at me around the restrictions on MPSO. Um, the, I would say that MPSO, it would be great to have that registered in MedTech. So we have a system where every, because we do so much MPSO, when we register it in the medication list in MedTech, but we change the provider name to supplied. So we could do, we can do a query build and an audit on all the MPSO that's, that has been supplied and delivered. With the, in, at least in the Bay of Plenty, and I think there's a move with Health One in the South Island, with the extraction of medication, of data from MedTech into bigger repositories, I think over time that may be solved because I agree. I think even, even within our own practice, if people aren't recording what they've been given by MPSO, we have no way of knowing, for instance, how many, how many antibiotic courses somebody's had. I'd say that's the biggest one that I worry about or non-steroidals, for instance. Um, so I think I agree with whoever wrote that. I think recording and monitoring usage of MPSO is a really big, important topic. I'd like to think we're moving forward in terms of how the data from MedTech can be extracted. The other question somebody asked me uh, about um, MPSO was whether I thought um, that the MPSO should be changed. I'm not sure. Um, I think MPSO really does need to be kept to the acute um, treatment, but I, I agree. For things that need to be started straight away, we probably do need a perhaps wider selection. So we actually keep on hand, and I, I don't know the details of how we do this, but we have um, an ACE, we have some bendrofluoside, we, ha we, have, we have a lot of medications on site. The problem, the, my big, our biggest beef with MPSO is there are things that we can get MPSO, and it's mostly creams, that are really expensive to the practice. So like pine tarsal is, I don't know, $10 or something. And so that somebody has to absorb that cost. So the way we do it, it was we actually prescribe it under the patient's name and then tell the pharmacy that we've already dispensed it and ask them to replace our MPSO stock. But yeah, so there's definitely things about MPSO that can and should be improved. Thank you. And while we've got you, Emily, we've got another one here. Hi, Emily. Do you have any data about whether your patients took medication as intended prescribed once they had collected it? <laughs> of course. Well, that kind of speaks, <laughs> that's kind of the next step beyond what, um, well, that's the other end of the spectrum of what Sandy was saying. So we don't have any, it's hard to gather data on what was prescribed. And yes, it's it's an age old problem of having um, information, how you collect that information of whether people have actually taken things. Uh, no, uh, we don't. Just like I don't think anybody in the country does. I know in America, they inserted little microchips into medications for mental health patients that would dissolve and ping a single to somebody that when they'd swallowed it, I don't think we've gone down that path in New Zealand. So <laughs> I think that's an age old problem, which is a real one, but I don't know, Sandy, do you have any other thoughts on how we measure that? No, I think that's why the the, the final driver, which is about medicine's appropriateness, is actually so hard to find um, data that would give us a sense of what's going on in that space. So we just um, haven't got systems in place that is actually able to give us a sense of medicine appropriateness as a driver. Um, we are only seeing it in terms of um, harm done, you know, into, I guess we are like non steroidals over prescribed to Māori and, and Pacific and we think it's because of, you know, that's the mismanagement of, of gout, for example, but we certainly don't have national data sets that can that point us in that direction. Fantastic. And then we've got one here. This is not a question, but I feel that bridging the gap with inequity is better achieved with an interdisciplinary approach such as Emily and our team have done. We have attempted to bridge the gaps by having better relationships with our local pharmacy. This includes having a pharmacist from the pharmacy come into practice two times a week to help with the GP's RN support better prescribing 
and have another access point to practice and vice versa. And I think that's what Emily's demonstrated beautifully is about how you do it across the, the team. Not one person is responsible for it, but everyone plays a role. And, and the acknowledgement's coming through about recognizing rural as a vulnerable population and pleased to see that it's a focus that you're looking to work on going forward. That's fantastic, thank you. And um, I think you've pretty much covered off the questions. Lots of lovely comments coming in from people and um, just about the enthusiasm that you've got for the work that you're doing and thanking you for sharing that information with us this evening. And I believe Emily, I don't know if you've got, well, I'll start with Sandy actually, if you've got any closing messages you would like to offer yeah, look, I, I want to say thank you to people who have taken time to actually participate. I was looking at the participant number and at one stage there's 118 people listening to us live on an evening. Um, and so that's really, that feeds my enthusiasm and my passion for this work. Um, this is actually unacceptable, this equity space that we're in. Um, and I think... Um, I really want to thank all those comments um, that are coming through for encouragement for this work. Pharmac is incredibly privileged and proud to be working in this space and in this mahi and, and to partner with, you know, um, Emily is one of our partners within this and giving us um, so much insight, actually, what is it actually happening on the ground? And uh, we've been really, really grateful for that partnership um, that we've had and we, we look forward to continuing this. Um, alongside, I also just wanted to, in my closing comment is that I think He Ako Hiringa, a partnership Pharmax pro provider is really going to turn our minds to medicine access equity from the um, educational resources that we'd be providing from the data aspect. So do sign up and do stay in touch. And also to keep an eye out for Pharmax, um, those larger data sets that I think we are going to produce that starts to give a, they, they start to tell a story. And, and that's really, really important is that this is the story, this is the why, this is how we can measure it. And I would say to every one of you, um, whether you're a clinician or non-clinician, I know that the, the equity seems so overwhelming sometimes that what is it that we can do? And it just seems sometimes beyond our control, but I hold on to the fact that I think in the space of healthcare system, we've, we can look at the access and we can look at the quality of care that we provide with a particular service. And in this case, if it's the service with the medicine, and those two things are going to help with um, getting people experiencing the best they can from, from the medicine. So that's my, my closing comments to, to um, the participants tonight. Kia ora. Oh, kia ora, Sandy, that was lovely, thank you. And I'll hand over to Emily. Thank you, Kathy and Cindy. Um, I'm not, I was, there was one last little question just about standing orders with MPSO and supplied medicines. And so I just wanted to quickly say, I totally agree. I think standing orders are really, really vital and important. And we operate absolutely with standing orders and Canterbury Health Pathway, shout out to them. They have a fantastic approach to standing orders that I encourage all of you to, um, to explore. And my request would be is if Pharmac could fund for every rural provider access to that standing order um, learning process that the that Health Pathways has, because at the moment only people in Canterbury can access it. And unless your DHB pays for it, you can't access it. And but Health Pathways, standing orders, absolutely. So but otherwise I just tell Toko and support everything Sandy has said. And yes, I um, Okay, so we'll close. Um, so I was in closing as a non, uh, oh, Pauline, did you want to? No, I just want to join in. Oh, okay, um, in close, thank you. And thank you to Mobile Health for supporting this evening. Um, and so just in closing as a non Tereo um, Maori speaker, um, here is a translation in English from a person who experienced terrible unfair oppression, and that is Anne Frank. I feel the suffering of millions, and yet when I look up at the sky, I somehow feel that everything will change for the better, that this cruelty too will end, that peace and tranquility will return once more. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Emily, Sandy, and Kathy, for your, for your facilitation skills tonight. Um, I'll close the meeting now.